Hi, it's Rebecca Whitman, your host of the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Show. I'm a top-rated life coach, an international best-selling author, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm on a mission to help you go from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. The experts on this show will help you achieve work-life balance so that you can experience abundance in seven pillars of life, spirituality, health, emotions, romance, mindset, social, and financial life. When you have all seven pillars of life in alignment, you are balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Balance, Beautiful, and Abundant Show. My name is Rebecca Whitman, and we are here to help you go from overworked and stressed out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Today, we have a very exciting guest. His name is Louis Lombardi. Louis, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. I met Lewis a couple months ago. I was emceeing a really cool event at UCLA called Blue Talks. And Lewis was there to do another podcast interview live. And he was so good and so inspirational that I asked him to be on the show. So welcome to the show. We're so excited to talk about persistence and how important that is to reach your goals and dreams. <clears throat> Before we get into the questions, I'd love to tell my audience a little bit about your background, which is so impressive. So Lewis has been on major TV shows that we all know and love. He had a recurring role on The Sopranos. He guest starred on shows like Chuck, Entourage, Heroes, CSI, Fantasy Island, and 24. So this was, I wanted to save this for the show, but I was actually on the first two seasons of 24. I was a featured extra in the counter-terrorist <laughs> agency. Oh, no, are you joking? I'm serious. I even got fan mail at Fox. Like I was <laughs> like, every time they showed the villain Nina in the first two seasons, I was like her right-hand woman. Oh my God, that's hysterical. So we're on the same show together. We were, were you ever, uh, were your scenes in the counter-terrorist agency or where were your scenes for 24? Uh, the, whole, the whole entire show, my uh, two, my two seasons, I, I was on 24 for two seasons, the fourth and fifth season. Uh, uh -huh. every, everything was in CTU at my desk. Okay, I was, so I was- the computer guy, <laughs> so I never left. Yeah. Oh, you were the computer guy. Okay, yeah. I was in CTU too. I got really good at fake typing. So. Me too. So good at it. I was like, <laughs> you're like what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, good I am. I didn't know what I was doing. I was method though. I was like, what am I really looking at when I'm typing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, I was. I was thinking about lunch. <laughs> yeah, they had good like food. Time. They had really good food. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your film career. So Lewis has been on amazing films and I don't have time to go through all of his filmography or we'd be here all day, but some of my favorites that you've been on are Usual Suspects, Natural Born Killers, Beverly Hills Cop 3, Spider-Man 2, and 3,000 Miles to Graceland. So let's hear your story how did you go from growing up in the Bronx to having this amazing acting career in Hollywood? Well, you know, it's kind of like the, of the mentality of uh, tragedies to triumphs in a way, you know? And I believe every single thing happens in, in life for a reason, you know? The worst things in your life happen for a purpose, always. So when I was a young kid, you know, growing up in the Bronx, like my father was killed when I was like three or four years old. So my mother, right, would, you know, she kind of went, you know, we had a, like a hard time. So she kind of left me with my grandmother, my other grandmother, my aunt. So as those years, I was five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. What I would do is I would just sit in front of the television, all in the family, the Jeffersons, all those 70s shows, you know, the odd couple was my biggest inspiration. So that, that tragedy that we had early on ended up, putting me in front of that television <clears throat> and I just submerged myself 
with television and films. I never went to school because my mother was really never around. So I was just thrust into society at five, 10 years old. Not, I didn't know anything. So how I did just, you learn how to read? When I was like uh, 11 or 12 years old, you know, I, I was a big football guy, right? So I would buy, I didn't really like school. So I never went to school. What I would do is I was interested in football. I was interested in street stuff because that's all we knew. So what I did was I bought books like John Madden had his books called One Knee Equals Two Feet. And that led to several more chapters in my life from reading that. We'll get to that in a minute. But what, so I started just picking up books and reading on my own stuff that interests me. So I grew up, I never really knew politics. I never knew religions. I never knew anything. Everything I learned was just me going out into the world and figuring it out alone. As a kid, 10, 5, 6, 10 years old, 11, 15. So, you know, so that tragedy ended up submerging me into the television, right, of my father, what happened with my father. So I, as I got older, I would just go to the movies instead of school. I would go to the, the big theaters. Remember, they had one big theater, Lowe's and Park Chester, all over the Bronx. And I would watch movies. And I still do it. I see three movies a week now. So that just... The, the biggest tragedy in my life, people, oh, that's so terrible. I go, absolutely not. And on the streets where we grew up, everybody was destined for either jail or to be killed. That's just the reality of my world. 99.9% .9 of the people in my neighborhood, no one escapes. So I had no choice. So I turned to the streets at 11, 12 years old. I mean, a big pussy from the Sopranos, who I ended up getting the role with, he knows me since I'm 13 because he owned the bar that we used to go hang out in at 12, 13 years old. And my uncles, you know, we would kind of go there and, you know, do our thing with him. And he knows me since I'm 13. And then 30 years later, we're on the biggest show in TV history together. Right. So did he, get you, did he get you on the show? How did no, you get no, you? I did, no, I mean, when people ask me about The Sopranos, oh, is that your first show? I've been acting since I'm 13. I have headshots. I did an independent movie that got me there. So anyway, so out of the tragedy came me absorbed myself in entertainment. And in the neighborhoods we grew up in, nobody accepts anything regular. Everything is, oh, I'm doing street, street, street. So when I wanted to be an actor, I would do, I didn't, I didn't have money to go to school or I didn't want to go to acting school. So what I would do is I would submit my stuff from backstage to, to NYU films <clears throat> and every independent film. And I would just submit every Thursday, every time that backstage I came. And, I, and so what I would do, I got hired on these little sets, right? Turns out they're not so little. They're $50,000 school projects. And everybody's making their own. So I would get on a set, get hired, and people would be like, we love this guy. You want to be in my movie? You want to be in mine? And I ended up doing, I don't know how many, but what it did was it taught me not only how to act on a live set, not in a classroom, because people think acting in a classroom is the same as in a movie. Mm -hmm. Wrong. It's all distraction, and, 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 and that's the biggest part of acting, is the distraction. Hey, I make a wardrobe camera. I don't say this is an action. You have to process two million things within a, within a minute and then re-go. So, you know, so I learned how to make movies. I got an NYU education without the degree. But guess what? If you put yourself to anything, you could learn anything. You don't really need a piece of paper. Unless you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, something really technical. But in life, business, entrepreneurs, entertainers, artists, you could create your own world. And that's what I did. And I learned it all on my own as a kid. And I used to take the Manhattan Express down to Manhattan for $4 or $3 back then. And I would go to NYU and I would walk around the city at 14, 15 years old. And I would just hang out with, and I would hang out with these. So I got a massive education with no degree, with no anything for free, but I had all the knowledge. You got OTJ, Lewis, on the job training. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. OTJ. Yeah, I love that. So what's hard is the harder hardest part of acting all the details coming at you, or is it memorizing your lines? Well, I could memorize a six-page scene right now. If you send me a six-page scene. So you built that muscle from a young age. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I built that. I I, I you know, I kind of always was easy with that. What I try to tell actors, they go, I've been in acting school for five years. I'm like, quit. Quit <laughs> acting and quit being in acting school for five years. Because if you need acting school for five years, you don't have it. You have no self-confidence. Self-confidence should just, what you do should come out, right? It should, you, whatever, your, whatever your passion is should come out of you, right? Yeah, so you don't so, think so, people should always be in acting class. They should do it for a couple of years, get the basic technique, and then 
go do it. Find school play, find student films, whatever they can do to, to hone their traps. And that's what I tell them. They go, well, how do I get into acting? I go, you need footage. And people out here in LA ask me, I go, go do USD films, UCLA films, independent films. Just, I ain't doing that. I go, okay. I did 30 of them. And look where my career ended up with no education. And I've written, directed, and starred in four films. I learned how to write my first month out here in LA. I learned by reading Quentin Tarantino's script over and over. And I would type in the breakdown. That's how I learned. You know, no one's going to come to you and say, here's a starring role, beautiful person. That's not reality. And I try to tell people in Hollywood, you got the illusion and the disillusion. The illusion is everyone's rich. Everyone's good looking. I mean, I could vouch for that. But, <laughs> but, of course. <laughs> but everyone's rich. Everyone's good looking. Nobody has a problem in the world. Everyone's famous. I know all these big movie stars that can't buy a, a, a soda because the business is so hard. And it's consistent and what we say persistence. If you don't do every day, I don't care how many shows you're on, you could be the winning Emmy. The tomorrow it's washed away. You gotta start from scratch. That's this business. And that's the problem where people get dejected, rejected, and go, I'm done. Because every day, you, know, you might get a movie, oh, I, I'm a, this is it. Okay. People tell me that now I get movies with the biggest people. I go, okay, where, I, I wanna get paid. I wanna go to my trailer. I, you know, I don't, I don't look at it as I'm going to be famous. No, <laughs> never did. I never wanted to be famous. I guess that's why I become so successful, you know? Right. So, yeah, I never looked at fame. I don't want to be famous. I just want to have fun. You know, I love interacting. When I'm, when I'm in, I played sports for so long, right? That it's the competitiveness is, is I always want to win. I tell people, I tell my daughter right now, I don't want to win the game. I want to win every single play in the game. I want to beat you every play. If I'm down by 70, I still want to beat you. That's like, you know, that's like that Michael Jordan mentality. Right. Uh, and if you want to be, if you're, if you're happy with second place, get off my team. Right? I don't, I I don't care. It. I want a participation trophy. I want to learn from my mistakes. If I lose and I feel heartache, it makes me hungrier for the next battle. And I did that. And, and I took that mentality to my audition process when I moved to L.A. Every audition I went to, all these 10 buddies, 100 of your buddies are in the same room, audition for the same role. And I would always exude confidence. That was my strength in, as my acting coach, as my street life. I was always able to adapt, you know, in any room with anybody, age, gender, didn't matter. I got along with everyone. So was the confidence real or did you fake it till you made no, it? No, it's extremely real, even till today. I go anywhere, I do, I don't care what you think of me, I don't, never did. You know, again, I grew up in this world where no one was like patting me on the back. No one was showing me, hey, this is a, no, everything I learned was organic, reading, writing, acting, you know, it was the way I believe was supposed to happen. And it all happened out of tragedy. Now, my father was a gangster, right? And he was killed when I was three or four. And now what I look at is this. People go, that's so sad. I go, absolutely not. Because generations of my family are all in jail or dead from the street life. Majority, all my friends doing 25, 30 years. And when I want to be an actor, they all laughed at me. Cut to 20 years later, I'm on The Sopranos. They're all calling me from prison. Oh my God, you're the cop. I go, remember when you used to laugh at me, motherfucker, you know? And they'd be like, I know, I know, I know, I know. And they're doing 30 years and I spent 30 years traveling the world. You're they, the one, you know, every family that has success and wealth and notoriety, there's always one person that made a decision. I'm not going to do what my parents and my grandparents said. I'm going to do something else. And I just want to acknowledge you for having the courage to be the one that changed your family. Well, I call it breaking the cycle. Yes. And, and, I, and I tell my daughter this every day. I go, the cycle of my life was jail, prison, death. Yes. You know? Jail, death, jail, that's just the cycle. So when I moved to LA and everything happened, now my father was a gangster. Now if he was alive, right? Would I have had this insanely great career? Who knows? Probably Maybe not. not. Maybe most not. Likely, most likely not. Yeah. Because I would have been shepherded because I was that person. You know, I would walk in a room, people just want to be around. Like the confidence was, I've had confidence since I'm five or six. That's been my whole thing, you know? And that's your superpower. It really is. It really is. It's a blessing. And persistence. Yes. Oh, I'm very persistent. You know, you know. I'm just charging so, my computer. I'm not disappearing on you. Okay. <laughs> All 
right. Um, so, so, but what I looked at as, I looked at as, you know, like the tragedies turn into triumphs if you make them that way. And my father, I could have ended up going to jail or be killed and I would never have my beautiful daughter. I would never have been able to break the cycle. So now I sit here with my daughter and I go, I told her this the other day. It's so funny when I'm in this conversation. I go, I go, you're never going to know what it's like to have your friends arrested and, you know, and someone being killed every few months that you love or you, you know, and you have to just learn to keep moving forward. I was always that person where I could just move forward. Biggest tragedies happen. I just keep swimming upstream. Everything's going to happen. You're resilient. Yeah, I like that word. <laughs> so do you know who killed your dad? You know which gangster um, killed no, I mean, it's just the streets, you know, everybody, you know, it's, it's the streets. And in those days, it was, that's what it was. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, you just, you just keep moving. I tell, I, and I try to tell my daughter this, and the society we have now is so broken down minded, weak minded people from social media. They believe what they see. They believe what they watch. They believe, you know, believe, do, do more research. Don't just watch social media. I don't put my television. My television don't go on for days sometimes. I don't put, I read, I read 10, 12 hours a day, all night, all day. Yeah, I just read. I've always done that. That was always my escape, you know? And, you know, and, and, and when you do something, if you're passionate, yeah, I tell people that. Another thing, if you show up to a room and you're like, hi, I'm so-and-so. Or if I show up, like, hey, how are you? How are you doing? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna show you what I love. And you're gonna be like, wow, I feed off this guy. You know, it's that mentality. Your passion should should get in the door, but your persistence should make you successful. Because persistence is day in, day out, no, 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 a million times, and then boom, you got once. You know, and that's what used to happen with my audition process. We go into a room with 80 guys that are your best friends, and they're all auditioning for the same role. You know, you're an actor, you understand that. And yeah. the jealous. The competitiveness, and that's where I excelled with the competitiveness. I'd always be like, wow, you know, I'd walk in these auditions, people would be like, oh, you know. I heard don't get sad, get mad when you don't get what you want. And that outrageousness, <laughs> being outrageous, like what you just said when you walked into the room, there's rage in that. There's yeah. rage and outrageousness. So Give us some other tips on how to handle rejection. Because a lot of people who listen to this podcast are salespeople and entrepreneurs, and they deal with a lot of rejection. Do you have any advice on how you deal with rejection? Well, you know what? I've dealt with rejection for the last 35 years of my career. You go on auditions, you get no, 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 no. But you know what? I build off those no's. And what I don't, don't, don't do when I get these actors that leave, fuck that, fuck, they don't know what the fuck is. I go, whoa, whoa. You're not maybe not right for the role, but if you burn the bridge with this woman or this guy casting you, they're never going to call you back. It's a business, dude. They, the same people I've been in business with for 30 years, these same casting people, I love most of them because they're so respectful. Hey, Louie, how are you? How you doing? And I built this relationship over 30 years. But if you go in with that, you know, attitude of why did they cast me? I'm better. No, no, no. I've written directed movies. Not everyone's right. Not everyone stands right next to each other. Not everyone's the same chemistry. Might not be your acting. It might be the look. It might be so many different things. As rejection, you get, you got to build stronger and stronger from every rejection. Learn from that. What happened at that rejection? They didn't like me. Why? They didn't like what I said. What did you say? Your own mind, I'm saying. What, okay, let me fix everything broken. See, I want to use people that if you go, hey, Louie, try this, this. Absolutely. You never know what you might learn. I don't care if it's the janitor or if it's the head of the studio. If exactly. it's a great idea, if it's a great idea, and it's going to move your project forward and it's going to make you successful for your family, your ego needs to be shown. And that's where rejection hurts people most, their ego. Oh my right. God. I'm not, I'm not that good looking. I'm not, I, look, I walk into every restaurant in this, in, around the world. I walk into every, with my sh sweatpants and my shorts. You don't like me, I leave. I've never been thrown out of anywhere. You know what I'm saying? You and, were wearing that before the pandemic. Now the whole world is wearing sweatpants and t-shirts everywhere. They followed me. I want residual. <laughs> You're ahead of your time. <laughs> but, but the rejection should build more strength. It should never crush you. 
And that's what I try to tell my daughter. Every single day in life, stuff happens, correct? Bad, negative. We go broke. We got normal money. We have a lose people in our families. Every day. It's a matter of just keep swimming upstream and be thankful you're here that day to witness whatever it is, good or bad. And, you know, I see so many people get crushed by rejection, and I think it's more out of ego. I agree. If your ego's out of it, See, I believe there is no rejection. You either get what you want or you learn something. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's right. There's no, there's no uh, losing because if you're trying something, if you're not trying, well, you, you're, if you're losing, that means you're just sitting on the couch. You're not going on auditions. You're not making your sales calls. You're not launching your business and you're not trying those. That's the only way to lose. But if you go for what you want and you don't get it, you either win or you learn. And that's what I say. I go, I go, failing is not not succeeding. Yeah. Failing is not trying. Yes. You know, I tell every young person that, whether they're in business or whether they're in acting, you know, it's 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 all the same. Business is act. Acting is a business, you know. So whatever we do is a business. Life is acting. I mean, that's what Shakespeare said. The world is a stage. You're acting a role in every moment, whether you're the CEO, a son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a patient, right. a, every, everything is acting. All right, exactly. Let me ask you a question. Do you think anybody can make it if they don't quit? Or do some people just not have what it takes? No, Even see, it's so always not necessarily you don't have what it takes. It be, the business is, is, has been and always is, and even more today, who you know. Yes. It's not like the biggest business, but the business is this big. The same people make the same projects 30 years. That's what I was telling you earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 such a hard business to crack to these days. It really is. And it's such an extremely hard business to make a living. The way all the unions have shrunk down, making less projects. No one's paying anymore. Only the studios are making the money and the big producers. And everyone else is getting crumbs. So I was very fortunate in the time I came in, it was work, work, work. I mean, I done like 70, 80 movies. Incredible. I, and like great movies. Like well, I, my, my, so when I got out of the NYU cycle, I did this independent film that took me to my start at Sundance, which was not known about. As soon as I got to LA, remember, I learned how to make these movies at NYU, right? As a kid. And the first five, six, 10 directors I got to work with, this became my real film school. And again, how I got, I met Oliver Stone, my idol, a film idol. I used to read his book. I used to, I want to be like Oliver, not even Scorsese as a kid. I love his gritty, realistic type films. And I was like, I want to be like Oliver Stone, right? I, I, I do this independent film. All my buddies are arrested. I, I have nothing. I, I got cast by Mira Savino before she was famous. She put me in this movie. We all drove from New York to L.A., from L.A. to Sundance to 1993. The film hits massively. Schwarzer what was the film called that won all these awards at Sundance? Amongst Friends. Okay. Okay. And Mira was just a casting person. Her dad put up 10 grand. She was no one. The reason she got in the movie was because the, the girl fell out. She knew the lines because she was helped casting. She put herself in and boom, Sundance, Robert Redford saw her, put her in quiz show, boom. That's how her career started. And I was, she cast me. So my, I ended up getting lucky as well. This film did massively well at the Sundance Film Festival. I got an agent immediately there, 1993. I didn't know. I'm a kid from the Bronx, like hustling on the streets. And all that. I was sitting in like rooms with like, you know, these men, Robert Redford. I'm like, oh shit. And I'm a, remember, I'm a TV and film guy now. I'm like, this is insane. Like, this is really what I want. I found my love. Like, I found my, 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 my path. Like, this is insane. All by tragedies. All my friends got arrested. I had no one. That tragedy again came to fulfill my whole career. So if I wouldn't have left, would I be here today? No. And out of tragedy, 30, 40, my dudes got arrested. They all got 25 years and I was sitting in the Bronx alone. No money, half going, this is insane. Like, you know, I'm so lucky I didn't get arrested. What do I do? And a month too later, my phone rings. I'm on my way to Sundance. Didn't know what Sundance was. Wasn't like, I'm going to Sundance. It was like, what is it? It's a film festival. Okay, I packed up what I had, like five grand in my car, drove it to cross country, picked up Mira, went to Sundance, film hits. So now again, my, my idol's Oliver Stone, follow me, right? I have no union card, nothing. I get back from Sundance, the director's like, hey, Louie, Oliver wants to meet me, not me, him, to direct the movie, would you drive me? Because I was the only one with the car, right? I was like, sure. I drive into the office, I go into the office, Oliver comes in, I'm like, this is freaking surreal. <laughs> 
like the guy that I've been looking up to for 30 years, like as my as a kid being a film dude. And he just walks in the room and he's like, all like grumpy and shit, right? Hey, you come in the come in the meeting to Rob. And I'm like sitting there, he goes, What are you doing? <laughs> I go, I, I just drove him. He's like, come on, come in the meeting with us. I get in the meeting, 20 minutes later, he, he wants to make a deal with the guy. He goes, turns to me, he goes, he goes, hey man, I love your look. I love you in the movie. I'm gonna put you in my next movie. I was like, what? I had no sad card, nothing. It was Natural Bone Killers. Oh, I love that movie. A week later, a couple of weeks later, I'm in the room with Robert Downey, Woody Harrelson, Tommy Lee, Tom Sizemore, casting other people to play against me. What was the role in Natural Born Killers? What was what? What was the role that you played, I played in a guard. I guard, Tommy, Long, Tommy Lee Jones' deputy in the prison. Amazing. But, but he just sent me a plane ticket. And, but my point is, is I projected that so much, like going, I want to be this guy. I want to be like him. I want to, I want to. And that was the first guy I learned from. You manifested he it. Manifested it. And, and he kept me in Chicago, in Joliet Prison, we filmed for three months with him, just hung out every night with him. Him, Robert Downey, Woody Harrelson became, I was a kid, I knew no one. They took me in like I would, again, maybe it was a personality where you just get along and Downey took me in and we had parties every night and it was a, it was a beginning of my career. So my point is I got my sad card on that movie. I met my, the guy and I'm watching him direct. And I was like, here's film school. Right. And then, and then when I left there, it was, Tim Burton, John Landis, Ivan Reitman, Brian Singer. These were my next group of directors that I would get hired by and just watch. So I thought NYU was a film school when I got to Hollywood and everyone loved me because I asked questions. What's this? <laughs> What's That's that? Great. And they loved it. All the old time DPs would be like, let me show you, Louie. You move the camera this way. You do this. The director would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So don't get in the way, but I should follow me. And I would be like, okay how to move a light, like what's the, you know what I'm saying? What's the technicalities of this of movie making? And I learned like that. And I learned like that, all self hands on deck from 12 to now. And everybody I'm on sets when I want to ask questions. They, you know, some people don't have the patience. What do you want to know? What if I get dumb? I don't know. I just like to learn. I love so to out learn. Of, out of all the people that you met from this journey that you just described, who changed your life the most in your career? Who was who was the person that changed your life? I know dad dying, having a single mom in your childhood, but as far as professionally, who changed your life? Like career-wise or personally? What, what did you learn from that you couldn't have learned any other way? Like you know, I really I really didn't have anything like that. Again, it was like when I was a kid, I didn't have anyone to teach me anything. So I always self-absorbed and learned everything. You know, like I didn't learn the most from myself, street guys. By observing like in Hollywood, which director or actor did you learn the most or were the most inspired by, by watching them and asking them questions? Uh, Probably uh, there was two of them. One was uh, Bob Richardson. He was a DP. I mean, he's like the biggest Academy Award winning DP, right? I was, I was natural born killers. And that's where I learned like, how to move the camera? What do you do? How do you do stuff like that? Like on a real left, you mm -hmm. know? But there was a guy, he passed away called Hector Alexandro. He was a DP. And he did a movie I called Deuces Wild. I did. Everyone was in it before they were famous. Johnny Knoxville, uh, Brad Renfro. Oh my God. Like uh, you go to James Franco. This was a cat, uh, Baltazar Getty, Norman Reedus. And I was a star of this stupid 1950s West Side Story gangster thing. It was hysterical. They dropped bricks on me. I got a body cast and stuff. Anyway, Hector Alexandro was this great, he was like this famous cinematographer. And I would just watch him, and I loved what we were doing. And I'd be like, "Can I? Hey, what's going on?" He'd be like, "Come here, Louis." Every day, and I was so interested. And he was kind of the one who pops out of me, always teaching me, like without me going, "What?" He'd be like, "Come here, you want? Let me show you." I'd be like, "Okay." You know, when you're on big sets, you don't want to fucking be the guy standing in the way, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. You know, especially when you got a hundred million dollars on line. But if they're calling you, he'd be like, "Don't worry, I, Louis." And I'd be like, "Okay." And I learned so many things from so many people. You know, it was a collaboration of knowledge from my 30 years. I absorb a lot from everyone. 
But as, as growing up, I never really had someone going, this is what you need to do. This is what you need. Even when I got to Hollywood, I didn't know a soul. I got out here with $5,000 in a car that I had from the street money. And that was it. That was my life after 20 years of being in the Bronx or whatever it was. You know, I had nothing. Basically came out here, didn't know anyone. And persistence never made me leave or quit. You know, even the competition, people get fearful of that. You walk into a room, 10 of your friends are auditioning, you immediately go into a spiral. What, what, what are they say? How are they, what are they doing? I don't give a fuck what you're doing. You know what I'm worried about? What I'm doing. I love, I love that. My mom used to say, or she quoted someone else who said it, you know, wear, wear blinders and run your own race or, you know, right. stay in your lane, stay in your hula hoop. Was there yeah, ever a time right. that you that felt so low that you actually considered quitting? And never. 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 You never you considered never. it. Never. You meet my daughter, you go, you yeah, she'll go, oh, yeah, he'll never. You say the word quit, I freak out. Get the fuck out of here. I start snapping. I, you want to quit? Because if you quit with something that you love, you're going to quit on everything in life. Get away from yeah. me. I'd rather be alone and win win individual battles alone and wars alone than have someone who's ready to quit every time it gets tough. Fuck is that? that that's life. Life's just tough, right? Yes, quitters <laughs> never win and winners never quit. So to you, quit is a, is a four-letter word. You're not allowed to use it in your house. Ask my daughter. She'll be like, don't say, don't say quit. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> I, I don't care if I'm losing by 100. I'm going to lose by 120, but I'm going to play. I'm going to play as hard as I can every play. And then you know what I'm going to do from that loss? I'm going to go, why did I lose? Remember I was telling you earlier why. What was the problem? What did I do? What mistakes did I make? Okay, we're going to fix it. The next one, we're going to win harder. You know, and I've always had that mentality. And for someone with no education, it's, it's, I won an Emmy for 24. You know, Congratulations. We won, yeah, we won an Emmy for Best Drama in nine, uh, the second and the fourth season. And, you know, it, it's, 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 again, persistence, but it's also not feeding into the rejection, to the negativity. Everybody out here has something stupid to say. Hey, you're going to do it like that? Hey, I'm better. Hey, I got that. They try to mind, mind mess with you. You get what I'm saying? You got to learn to sidestep most people. And, and this is not negative. This is extremely positive. People go, what do I do? I go, number one, listen to no one. Listen to no one. If you follow your parents' dream or your brother's dream or your sister or your wife's dream, that's not you following your, your passion or your love. You're following what other people want out of you. You know, never listen. People say, that's not, that's a dumb idea. Thank you. I've been told my acting was a dumb idea since I was 13. I'm getting calls from every prison in the country. Oh, remember that? I go, yeah, remember when you told me I stopped? Oh, no, no, we were joking. We were joking, buddy. I have that prison cell. I'm in Japan right now eating sushi. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Literally. You it's, know? Are any of your friends still alive that most you ran the street Most with? of them. I, and I love most of them. Like, I bust balls when I go back to the Bronx. They're still my family. I mean, no, you know, not every person who goes to jail is a, a hard person or, or a bad person. I got to be honest. I'm not like advocating for criminals or i'm not advocating for prisons but what i know one thing is a lot of people especially in the drug world with the new laws got so hammered first time non-violent drug offenders that if you would have gave five years instead of 25 they would have never committed another crime and they're not bad people they're not they never harm the fly and i don't and don't get me wrong i believe selling drugs you harm everyone yeah you know i don't like drugs at all you know i really don't i don't drink you know i, I just like staying home and cooking you know so my point is, is, but if you're not like physically out there doing bad, bad stuff, this, I know a lot of people in prison that should be doing 25 years. They should be doing five. And you know they would never do another crime. But yes. so it, it, it is what it is. And, and I always look at that and I go, you know, I still love my friends. You know, they, they, my family and my, my friends made me who I am. I'm brought up by three women, all women, all the men were either dead or in jail. That's the moral of the story. And, and what happened was, go ahead. What makes me uh, what makes me wonder about your acting is you grew up with gangsters, but it sounds to me like you always play the cop and the good yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, and that's the funny thing is that's my ironic. My grandfather's a hardcore. He did thirty straight years. Okay, I've been visiting the system since I'm five. I'll show you pictures of me five in Lewisburg Penitentiary to forty five in Otisville. All the same kids, just grown in the same visiting. So. I used to get calls from my grandfather. 
Mogul, my grandson is a cop. Again, he's a cop on 24. He's the cop. All the kids, all my buddies were passing around and going, it's the funniest thing is you're the cop. Because I was always like the leader of these guys, you know. I was always like the aggressive, tough guy. You know, that mentality of, of I told you of always winning, that came from the streets. Mm-hmm. But if you beat me once, you beat me all the time. And I don't just mean sports in, in you know, in the street shit. If you, if you well, I'm not going to pay you. Okay. You, what are you going to do? You're going to get beat every time. I was the exact op. I was the pit bull lion. Would you say? People be like, no, okay. And I always had that. Okay. You're trying to like, ch- you know, that mentality came from the streets. You beat me once. I'm, I'm a punk. But if I, if I step up immediately, you know, it's like punching a bully in the mouth. They'll never mess with you again. Right. Right. And I've right. always had that mentality, you know, and, uh, Sometimes I try to teach my little girl that, and she's like, that, uh, relax. I'm like, I'm just saying. She's like, oh, I'm not punching anyone in the face. It's, but that's just a metaphor to mean and to always stand up for yourself. I want to teach her to be a strong woman, you know, like my grandmother was. My grandmother brought all of us up. That's where I learned how to cook. My mother, when she got back on her feet, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, brought, I am the product of three women, okay? And that, my grandmother was, made John Gotti look like an altar boy. My grandmother was hard. My grandmother did prison time. My grandmother was gorgeous. She looked like Sophia Loren. But Your she was, grandmother did prison time. Five years. For what? I don't know. <laughs> wow. So even your grandma was a gangster. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So, but she taught me the mental toughness to survive every day. Life is bad. And that's where I got that from five, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old. What, is, what are you crying about? What does it matter? And thank God I had her because that made me successful. Mm-hmm. I think in all aspects of my life, that strong, determined, never, never lay down, never, never, never cry, never, whatever, what are you doing? And I got that from her, you know, and I, and I blessed because mm-hmm. what happened was I learned how to cook my whole life from all these women. I would just sit in the kitchen. I loved cooking. Turns out 30 years later, my second career is the pizza company, right? Which all comes from me cooking every single night for 30, 40 years. So not only did I get my first initiation of, of, of the Hollywood, but that whole beginning part of me learning how to cook is now turning into a massive company and a career. So again, what's we're tra- the company? What's the pizza company called and how can we get our hands on the pizza? It's called Ava Lou's Italian. Oh, I was actually, yeah. I was just at the pizza convention. Oh, good. Let me see. Can you see it? Uh, AVA for those Ava people listening. L- yeah, Ava L- Italian Pizza Company. We're about to launch it. It's a frozen pizza line, you know, f- f- recipes from back when I was five in the kitchen with my grandmother. And, uh, you know, but again, the tragedy of, 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 of me being stuck with three women thinking we didn't know men around turned out to be the best thing. Because now, my second half of my career is what they taught me, like, per- like my whole life. So, it, it, again, the tragedy is a massive triumph for me, again. Again, every time something looks bad, you make a positive out of it, you know? But growing up, you know, no one knew anything but, but the hustle, you know? And, again, breaking the cycle to me, though, in anything, whether, you're, whether your family drinks, whether your family's drug addicts, if you're able to break that cycle, you're blessed. You're blessed. And I feel blessed. And I told my daughter the other night, you're never going to know what it is for your dad to be arrested. I mean, thank God. Hopefully not. <laughs> you know, but all like all like gangsters hanging around all day, you're never going to see that. You're going to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever you're going to be. And I couldn't be any prouder. And being brought up by old women was the best thing happened because what happened? I had a daughter. You get it? God just she works. Gonna, it. How is she going to learn the same mental toughness Growing up in such a cushy life, how are you going to me? Uh, hang out with me every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still the. I'm the, I may look old, but I'm still the persistent, every day, in your face. And I don't mean physically or verbally. I mean whatever I'm doing, I'm there. I'm I'm present. Yeah. You know. And again, I, I tell her we don't want failure. We don't. I don't. I don't mind failure if you try. You get yeah. it. But I don't want laying on the couch because it'll it starts to infuriate me. And I start staring at her, and she'll say, <laughs> she'll say, "Okay, what do you want to do?" We did a put it this way: I had me and her. We downloaded an app, and we did a business plan for my company. Right, me and her. She's seventeen. She's smart. She's beautiful. And we sit down. We start going to our thing. 
Two weeks later, I'm like, wow, this is pretty good. I sent it to Harvard people. They're like, who did this for you? It's me and my daughter put our mind to it. And I showed her the note, the message from him. And she was like, holy cow. I go, this is what I'm saying. We could do what we could do. We don't need a million people. You did this with me. You did it first time ever. And look how great you created a real deal business plan for, we're trying to raise like millions of dollars and people love it. But we did it out of just learning right there together. You know? So let's pretend I am like one of the Shark Tank people and you're pitching your pizza to me. What makes your pizza so special? Why should we invest in your pizza? Because you well, never know someone might listen to this and want to invest. Yeah. Well, that's a great question because what differentiates my, my frozen pizza from most is my pizza are made in New York. What's the most important ingredient, they say? The New York water, bagels, pizza. My, my, I'm one of the only frozen pizzas that are made in New York with New York water. And my recipes go back to... The, you, I don't know if you know about the food preparations, but you know, like the high hydration where it makes it fluffy. I made, I took me years to do this. I cook every single night in my kitchen with my daughter. I teach her to cook. It's a life skill. It's so important for her family, for, you know, future. So I created this amazing recipe and I wouldn't veer from it. I was like, no, I want this. So I don't want to, I'm not just going to put my name on shit and put, I want it to be great. So it took me two years, but I created a New York style pizza that you would get at a New York corner pizzeria. And the genius of my business plan is I want to create this franchise where we could put a, a pizza company, a New York pizza company on every corner in America where un unconventional pizza places can't go. Like conventional pizza places need a hood. They need this. They need that. Mine, you could put anywhere because the, the equipment is so limited. So we're going to build a franchise like a little season, but without the labor, no cost of goods. And every single one of them is going to be consistent on a daily basis because the product is shipped in, put in the freezer, and then made. You don't even know they're frozen. I'm working right now on getting on QVC. They love the product. Hotel groups love them. Yeah, because they put them on their menus. That's Can you make them gluten-free or no? Because they're New York. We will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to that <laughs> one next. But we <laughs> you know what that means, right? <laughs> yes. So... My point is, is the great concept of my, my, my company is, is you can open these places anywhere, $50,000 each place, because you don't need a lot of equipment. You're not going to have, you're going to have low labor, no waste, no one could steal because everything's accounted for. So the business model is so firm. It's so solid that people are like, wow, this is a great idea. And when they eat the pizza, they're like, these pizzas are great. You don't even know they're frozen. Right. So, great. So we can, we can open them up in front of everywhere where you can open a real pizza place. Any kind of storefront can, where you only need an electric oven and a freezer and a beautiful counter. So people are going, investors are like, wow, we can start like the next Little Caesars type concept, but without the labor cost and without the waste and without the cost of goods. There's so many things and lower rents because you only need a 500 to 1,000 square foot location. That's so you don't... Yes. And I don't want to do them in New York. I want, I want to do them in LA. I want to do them in the middle of the country and create this pizza company where you can come and get pies, slices, frozen. You know, I have a gelato. I'm only going to, it's going to be like an in and out based menu where it's simple. You come in simple and easy and fast. New York pizzas have really big slices, right? It depends. Not now. Oh, okay. Cause I was going to say, can you buy it like by the slice? Like yeah. with New York pizza, or do you have to buy the whole pie? No, you could buy them by the slices. You can buy them by the pie, cooked. You can have, buy them frozen. You know, I'm going to have so many different outlets of the product, too, you know. And I want to put in there schools, hospitals, colleges, New York-style, old-school, walk-up, grab-and-go. It's not going to be like, hey, guy singing in my restaurant. They're going to be like the right. window, the boot, you come in, you grab, you go. I want that fast-paced. New York style that we used to do when we were younger. The window, remember you go up to the window, hey, give me your car, I gotta go, or the bus is coming, you know? Right, exactly. I want that. And, and the product is absolutely just as good as any New York pizza place because I got a lot of my recipes. All well, my buddies own pizza. I just got back from the pizza convention. I've been doing this for 50, for, since I'm five. My grandmother would teach me. And the pizza actually came from, it's a funny story. My grandmother would cook for like 20 of us, pitch, cook it for 20 and me. Right, because all we, oh, my grandmother had two boys, my mother had two boys, my aunt had two boys, everyone had boys. So there was three women, but 
cook, hanging out with Neanderthals like me and my nine cousins, right? So that was our family, three women with all these big gorilla boys. So she would have to cook like a lunatic. So every Sunday, her father would come over, my grandmother's father, and he would bring these peas. He didn't speak English, Italian guy, a little suit on, his little Remy Martin and his wine. And he would bring these tin foils, and he would open them up. And they were tin foils, they were pizzas. And he would use tomatoes from his garden, the basil from his garden. He would make his own crust. And that uh, was the inspiration. I would watch him and he would eat the pizza. And I would be like, this is what I want to recreate. And that's what I did. I created a New York Italian style pizza, you know, with fresh tomatoes, Parmesan. I didn't even want mozzarella on them. I just want the Parmesan with the basil. And you're making me hungry. It sounds amazing. <laughs> but, from it, but, but yeah, well, anyway, so that's like the, the, the basis of, of the company. From that, that's my link recipe, tree. And, all my and finally, all my buddies, if you want to up level your out. finances so this year, the then the you plan. will well, not want to miss my I mean, Manifest I'm Money March free like Zoom class. class. It's you know, on March 26th at 1 that. p.m. Little, Pacific, you know, 4 p.m. Eastern. Now, which is so it great. is going to rock your world. We're going to show but, you five yeah, so the, so things the, the, the that you can do to start well, making you can put a six-figure side a, a pizzeria, hustle. A New York style Let's do this. Go to the link in my bio. Get in on all this How good stuff. If you have any questions about any of this, the best way to reach me is through sending me a DM on Instagram. Instagram and make sure you're well, you following me there. My and until my, my we meet again, my friends, I will see guy. you on another episode Way of the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Show. My, and we're my taking you from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Like Thank right. you for your support, and we'll see you Everything. soon. Everything. You know, I get in there, I don't care. I love it. I love cooking. I love playing with chefs. I love tweaking recipes. I just love it. There is no diet out. I've been doing this since for 50 years. I'm 55. I've been doing this for 50 years, like with the same enthusiasm and passion that you saw me when I was eating that Sicilian, looking at my great grandpa, to now when I'm sitting here with my daughter making my own breads every night and bagels. You know, I make my own bagels. I make my own breads. So I, I just, it's never bored me. You know, it's, it's always. In your blood. Yeah, it's in my blood, you know, and I had great teachers, you know. So. I don't know. I, I can never see myself throwing. I don't like cooking anymore. Never. You're going you're gonna to pry that wooden spoon out of my dead ham. <laughs> I love it. So the last question is, what would you tell your 18-year-old 18 year 18 year self, Lewis, that your 55-year-old self knows? If you could sit down with him, what would you tell him? Invest. In what? Whatever. Whatever you whatever you love, I mean, you you, you do your, you do your due diligence. Invest in anything, real estate, your life. Don't you you know when you make some money? I was my biggest mistake because you know why? Again, I go back to no one really taught. Me. I didn't know how to do. I could have bought twenty houses when I was young. I had, especially when I got off Fantasy Island, I had so much money at thirty years old. I was like, I try to get my ex-wife to do, and she's I don't want to do real estate. I was like, okay, what does she do now? Real estate, you know? We could have owned thirty houses. I was like learning going. I could put down 30 grand a piece. They're in the Bronx. They're worth 300,000. And I started learning this at 30 something years old. But when you don't have that support system to behind you every day in your house, that's a detriment. And I tell my daughter this, even the other day, I go, when you meet someone, don't look about how good looking they are or how much money they have. Look about how much they support you in your relationship, how much they cheer for you every time you win. Otherwise, you're in a dead end relationship. You know, and I've learned that the hard way. That was one of my lessons in life, you know. You know, my ex-wife, you know, she didn't want, yeah, I want to do this. I don't want to do that. What do you want to do? Travel around the world? I want to be, you know, I want to own 20 homes. You know how to do it, I told her. You do this. Like, before you met me, I put up the money. We can get the loans. I have my credit scores, 850. <laughs> you know, right. till today. Yeah. So, yeah. but anyway, so that's so that's such an important part of life. And I, what I would say is if I was, if I would, if I can go back to 18, and I had this knowledge, I would be buying these houses that I could have bought for $300,000, not an hour, a million. I could be just getting 10000 a month rent from each one. I have five, six, I'd be making 100000 a month. And, right. it was that, and believe it or not, not to say it was easy, but it was that easy. You it's know? a lot easier. It was a lot easier then to get into real estate when you were yeah. 18. But I would still tell people that are listening, if you have extra money, 
to invest in real estate, especially if you're in New York or Southern California, because it always goes up. So just get in where you fit in. But if you have a way to get in, get right. in because it's, it's, it's great. And that's great advice to give a young person. Well, Lewis, this has been an amazing conversation. I know my wonderful audience is going to want to stay in touch with you. So where can they find you on social media? You can go to my Instagram at Lewis Lombardi or, or follow my Lombardi Foods page, Lombardi Foods. That's where we're like, you know, we're starting to build a foundation for the pizza company there as well. But you know what's even funnier? You know, I got my real estate license as well, right? I have no education. What I, I didn't did, know that. I, I was doing a movie because then we'll finish the conversation, but yeah, I was sure. doing a movie. And uh, my, my, I was like, I want to get my real estate license. People are like, oh, it's hard. It's like passing the bar. It's a four hour test, you know, all the chirping. I was like, good for you, right? Good for you. I went, I was doing a movie. I got all the real estate stuff sent to me. I had it in my test, right? I just didn't even study. I went to my stuff and I just, one night, the night before I read a thousand page book, just browsed through it, you know, I need a book. The next morning I got up, I went to the uh, real estate school, uh, the, 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 t the state thing. I sat there, the girl's like, wow, you're in a good mood. I go, she goes, everyone here is horrified. They were all like panicking, everyone, I'm like, <laughs> Well, what are we in jail? Like, well, who gives a father? She goes, well, I go, well, if I fail, you'll see me again next week. And then next week, and she loved me. The girl, she's like, that's a good attitude. Long story short, I go in, two hours later, I come out, everybody's still studying. I go, wow, I must have messed this up. I got done in two hours. I was just flicking things, right? Like, I flicked, you know, common sense. I was like, anyway, I get out there. I pass it the first time with no studying, no education, nothing. That just means people are so negative. It's a bar. I passed it. I failed it three times, which are dummy. <laughs> but 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 my point is is that was something I didn't really know and I excelled at something just out of my passion for, for architecture and design. That's why I did it. You know? You passed it because you're smart, you're very well read, and you have a great attitude. You know, we talk a lot about on this show that your thoughts create your reality. Mm -hmm. And you're so great at thinking positive and keeping your vibe high that you attract things to you with ease and grace, which is the whole goal of being balanced, beautiful and abundant. So Lewis, thank you thank so you. much for sharing that story and for being a wonderful guest. You have just such a beautiful soul and I can't wait to get my hands on this pizza. I live in LA, so I hope <laughs> you have a grand opening and invite me and my husband, Ben. We'd love to celebrate your new franchise opening and, and have pizza. Pizza is my happy place. So everybody, thank you for watching the Balanced, Beautiful and Abundant show. I am your host, Rebecca Whitman. And I empowering you, I am empowering you to go from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. And until we see you again, keep your vibe high and magnetize. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lewis.